for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm John Carnegie. I lead, along with uh, Rob Whitney over there, the Business New Zealand Energy Council. Welcome to this, the second of Business New Zealand Energy Council's Meet the Energy Spokesperson a series, having hosted, of course, the Minister late last year in the first of our series. It's great to see such a, a full turnout uh, today. Thanks for coming along. Um, in terms of running order uh, this afternoon, I'll hand over to our guest speaker, Stuart Nash, in a few moments. Um, and after he's spoken, we'll have a chance for some Q&A, uh, followed by a light lunch that I hope you'll all stay and uh, join us for. Um, at the Business New Zealand Energy Council, we use the World Energy Council's energy trilemma. So they are the dimensions of energy equity, energy security and environmental sustainability. And we use it as a framework for how to think about uh, the achievement of balanced energy policies. And in fact, we're extremely proud to say that New Zealand ranks an extremely creditable tenth on the WEC's global ranking. It's one of the WEC's so-called PAC leaders, uh, though of course this ranking is always at risk as others improve and we do not. Um, but this high ranking that we've got actually doesn't mean to say that we as a sector can rest on our laurels and in fact doing this resulted in the New Zealand Power proposal uh, which we might hear a bit more about uh, later this afternoon. And we think that the power of the trilemma framework is compelling. It allows us to have a more informed, evidence-based conversation about policy settings, uh, where the tensions are in those settings and inevitably where the trade-offs need to be made. So in fact, we're extremely pleased to hear Stuart mention the trilemma in a recent uh, parliamentary debate. Um, yes, Stuart, you may find it hard to believe, but there are some of us policy tragics who listen to the parliamentary <laughs> debates. Um, the BEC is also consistent with another helpful uh, WEC uh, methodology, developing a New Zealand unique pair of whole of energy sector scenarios to 2050, and which will also be helpful in developing good policy and informing business decisions. And you'll be hearing more about this exciting project over the, the coming months. Now, I think we can all see, given the interest in this event, that it uh, couldn't have been more timely. Um, there's a lot going on in the energy space. Um, we've had the recent announcements from the Electricity Authority around transmission pricing options and the pending now 3 August decision uh, by Rio Tinto regarding the future of the bluff smelter. So this in fact provides us with an interesting backdrop to, the, to, to today's discussion about energy policy alternatives. So now I'd actually likely, like to formally welcome you Stuart. Stuart is the Labour Party's energy spokesperson amongst a number of other business facing portfolios. I thank you, Stuart, for coming to talk to us today. Uh, we're keen to hear about the what and the how you are thinking about energy policy alternatives. Um, and I know that while we don't use the Chatham House rule here for obvious reasons, it's being recorded, um, I'm sure that the audience will be respectful uh, with what they hear from you today. So we look forward to working with you, Stuart, as your thinking evolves. Stuart, the floor is yours. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you, John. I suppose like a lot of you, we spent an hour last night in a meeting determining what we would say if the aluminium smelter closed or if it remained open. So we had one set of press releases, this is what we're going to put out if they announce closure, this is what we're going to put out if they uh, say they're signing on again. We didn't have that one in the middle, which is, uh, and you know, I phoned a lot of people, a lot of my friends saying, what is going to happen here? And everyone said, well, we think they're going to re-sign, and I said, is this wishful thinking or is this the reality? And people were saying, well, we think it is the reality but I don't know if anyone saw the fact that they were delaying it a month. Now, I don't know if this is the tactic of a large multinational trying to screw uh, the sector down or whether they have genuine concerns. They're looking to see what's going to happen with the exchange rate, aluminium prices. Uh, we believe it's probably a negotiating tactic, but let's wait and see what happens there. Um, as John mentioned, there is often a trade-off when you're a politician speaking in a Chatham House rules environment versus an environment where you're taped uh, and the reporters in the room. Obviously in a Chatham House rules environment I can give you my thoughts um, around a whole lot of topics which aren't necessarily policy or, or that uh, my party would be most uncomfortable if they were out there. Uh, but in this sort of environment I've got to be a little bit guarded around my personal thoughts because if it does get out there then it's not good for my own political future or what we want to achieve as a party. 
And obviously I'm in the game of politics. You know that. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But there are some things that have a political angle and some things that have a, an economic angle. And sometimes the political angle overrides the economic angle, if you know what I'm saying. And we can talk about that um, in question time if it comes up with that. First of all, I do want to say that the Labour Party is not here to close any industry down. We are pro-development. We understand that in order to deliver the sort of programs that we want to deliver, we need a really strong economy. That means development, that means jobs, that means foreign direct investment, uh, as well as local investment. So I often hear, oh, you know, you guys are just anti-development. That is not true. In fact, I think it would be irresponsible for any government to come in and say, you know, we're going to close down the oil industry, or we're going to nationalise this, or this is how we're going to run things, because that simply isn't the case. Uh, everyone knows that in an MMP environment, uh, you've got to have coalitions. Uh, and in 2005, we had a coalition with Winston. We didn't have the Greens in play, <coughs> excuse me, obviously. But the reality of, um, of politics going forward is that if Labour is in government, it will probably have to be in a coalition with the Greens. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. That sort of came out as a, bit, as a bad thing. Um, but you've also got to remember that the senior coalition partner is basically the one that comes up or that drives the economic agenda. Um, and it's not the junior coalition partner. And, and, and I would say this is the case here. So every now and again, I do read something that the Greens have put out in terms of this industry. And I go, oh, shivers. OK, that's the Greens, not us. But you always have to, you have to remember that as well. Um, John did mention the energy trilemma. And I have talked about this a lot for, for a couple of reasons, for, for good reasons and bad reasons. The good reasons are we are sitting at 10th, which looks pretty credible. But the reason we're sitting at 10th, if you have a look into it in a little bit more detail, is because of our... Uh, the stability of the government, for example. There is no political risk in this, well, very, no, there's always political risk, very little political risk. So I think we're about fourth in the world in terms of political risk. If you look at the, um, the variables, though, that control uh, security, equity, and environment, uh, there, it's, not so, it's not so good. I think security, we're sitting at around about 16th. Don't quote me on that. Well, someone probably will quote me on this. Um, and we, we've been stable over the years, over the last sort of three or four years. On equity, though, we've dropped. I think we're about 32nd, correct me if I'm wrong, John. And in the environment, we're about 46. So, and, and I, I go on a lot about this. And I'll just, before I get into a little bit more detail, I'll just give you an overarching view of where I see things as a politician. Uh, one of my favorite books is um, uh, a book written by Peter Bernstein. It's called In the Lap of the Gods, The Amazing History of Risk. I don't know if you know it, um, but it is, a, you know, it, it is literally what the title says. It, it maps how risk has allowed the modern economy to develop in a way that it never did. It talks about the Roman times, the Egyptians, the Greeks, all this sort of current. They never mastered risk, and therefore they, the economy didn't grow in a way that perhaps ours has in the 21st century. It's a fascinating book, and that's how I look at everything. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, the first time, I mean, I'm, I'm a businessman, I just want to put that out there. Whenever I start a business project, the first thing I do is I set up a risk register. And I look at, okay, what are the major risks here? What are the chances of this occurring? What are the impact that this risk does occur? And what are the mitigation strategies? And I take that approach to politics as well. In fact, I, was a, I had to run from a finance and expenditure select committee today, and we were talking about um, a petition, a guy called Sir Alan Mark, who's a very, very you know, credible gentleman, wants the government to put in place, well, and his group, and Sir Geoffrey Palmer was there, and a whole lot of other really notables, to undertake a country risk analysis, which includes things like climate change, um, the environment, as well as economic and social risks as well. And so when I look at the, um, the energy sector, I look at it from a risk perspective. This is in terms of a management, uh, of a government, whole of government management perspective. And I say, okay, what sort of risk do we want to take as a government? And uh, obviously if the government takes on risk, then, um, then there's taxpayers' money at risk. And so we have to be very careful how we do this. I mean, you think you guys get hauled over the coals by, uh, by your stakeholders and your shareholders. We get hauled over the coals once every three years. So we're, on a, we're just public servants on a three-year contract. The other thing I would say is I'm not an expert in the energy sector. And the thing about uh, members of parliament is you, you very rarely find that there is an expert that comes in and does that role in parliament. The, you know, the couple of exceptions, and this is where we use the list very well, is Tim Grosser. Now, Tim Grosser could be an MP in any side of the house. I believe. But he is an expert in trade policy. He's brought in uh, to be our trade negotiations minister and he does a superb job. There was a real risk actually in the last election that Tim, well there was a feeling for about a minute that Tim might have won a seat and he was horrified. I think he even took down a whole lot of his hoardings. 
you know, Tim does not want to be an electorate MP. He does not want to sit down and talk to people about their, you know, their budgets, their state housing problems and problems with wins. He wants to be out there negotiating trade agreements. And so um, the, re the reason I say that is, for me, this has got to be about a partnership. And I've spoken to some of you privately about this. What I would love the government to be viewed as, at some point in time, is actually as a partner in the development of the industry going forward. Obviously, we've got to be a regulator, and we've got the Commerce Commission doing that. We've got the uh, Electricity Authority in terms of the electricity sector doing this. And, uh, and, and that's just part and parcel of the government. We all understand that. But I would like, um, and it'll take a while, I understand that, but I would like us to be seen as working with the industry and coming up with solutions to 21st century issues, as opposed to, um, to a system or an organisation that's just out there saying, no, you've got it wrong, you're doing it wrong, uh, you can't do this and you mustn't do that. We would love to hear, well, I would love to hear solutions from you to the issues we're facing in the sector at the moment. Uh, and let me, give you, um, let me give you a couple of examples. You know, I've taken a good hard look at the Lions companies, for example. They've got about $15 billion <laughs> worth of debt uh, and, a, and about, on about, mm, no, sorry, they've got about $15 billion worth of assets. Um, the, it's really hard to understand their debt, and I'm doing a lot more work into this because there's a lot of um, deferred taxation, this sort of carry on, but I need to know what their, uh, their bank debt is, and I haven't, I haven't come to that conclusion yet. But we're facing a really, you know, a, a world that is changing, and a changing in a fast rate, a great rate of knots. I don't know if any of you saw the article on Campbell Live when it was around, it was about two months ago, I think, where they um, had a shot of these Stanford graduates working in a lab. They came up with a battery made of aluminium, I think it was made of aluminium, that would charge your phone in a couple of minutes, literally. Now, the way things are moving in the sector from a Stanford lab to commercialisation is not going to take very long. And when you've got organisations like Apple with cash mountains of $65 billion dollars, you can imagine these guys want to jump on a technology and it doesn't matter if it doesn't work because it'll, only, it'll mean they have $64 billion or they go out and sell a few iPhones more. So the world is changing in terms of new technologies, but it's also changing in the way that people are going to invest in these technologies and certainly changing in the amount of money that is out there to explore these opportunities. You, you could argue with Elon Musk for the first time ever, we've got a guy who's given the fingers to the big oil companies and saying, I'm going to change the nature of this whole industry, and I can't be bought. Now, whether he is, um, whether he is just the front runner and he'll be superseded by someone in six months or 12 months or five years, who knows? But the fact of the matter is, it is happening. And let's start with the electricity sector. Um, you know, I, I have, to be honest, I have concerns about what's happening with this sector. As mentioned, we've got a lines company. I think we've got 29 lines companies with a, with a, um, with a. Uh, with assets of $15 billion uh, in a game that is changing rapidly. Um, the, the one company that I've spoken to, and I'm not speaking, I, and I'm just using this as an example, I'm not saying all the other companies are like this. You know, Vector, for example, at the moment is leasing solar panels and it has the franchise or the license for the Tesla batteries. You know, and from what my exploration, it tells me this is one company that understands it is no longer a lines company, it is an energy company. But we've just had it select committee the Lions company, it does Ochohonga and Taramanui, uh, they have a number of submitters there who are really annoyed with their pricing structure. And they are an interesting company because they have a whole lot of batches in their, uh, in their jurisdiction. So they've got a whole lot of people around Lake Taupo, etc., who are paying high prices for their power, uh, who at some point in the next two or three or four years, and let's make an assumption if you own a batch, you've got a little bit of disposable outcome. Not always the case, but let's make that assumption. At some point, you're going to say, you know what, I'm sick to death of paying a power bill for 12 months of the year when I'm only there for six weeks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put solar in, I'm going to put one of these batteries in, I'm going to sink that 10K into it. It mightn't be a rational economic decision, but this is what I'm going to do because I'm sick to death of this. And we saw this in this country. Remember when we had... Um, what were they called? The, the four ones of telecom. There was only one company here, and if you wanted to get a line chain, you know, a new phone line, and it took six weeks, and you had all this, you know, it was dreadful. Um, and what happened is a competitor came in, and people jumped, not because the new competitor offered a better service, which in fact they did, but because they were so sick of being absolutely rorted, or well, in their perception, by the monopolistic. Um, a behaviour of the only one guy in town that they jumped. And the Lions company, I think, is, and this is, I'm just using this as an example, runs the risk of this. They say we've got to have the, um, the, um, 
the infrastructure in place. Uh, and we've modelled this on peak capacity, and if we haven't got the inf infrastructure that can take peak capacity, uh, then we run the risk of, of failure. And this comes down to this whole energy security thing. Well, at some point, those people who have got to, uh, you know, the 20 houses down uh, Hartipi Road on the, on the um, what is it, the, the western end of Lake Taupo, eastern end of Lake Taupo, are going to say, um, you know what, bugger this. So of those 20 guys, 12 guys are going to go into solar and battery because they're only there in summer. Uh, if, you know, if it's cold water for a summer shower, that's fine. They don't ski because when they ski, they go and stay in Awakuni. But the lines company is going to be expected to provide infrastructure for that whole cul-de-sac when there's only eight players in there. So you're taking out 60% of those guys who are going to use your infrastructure. And someone said to me, no, no. The lines company can mandate that you actually pay the lines charge. And I say, well, that'll be interesting. Let's see, let's see if that holds up in court. If you're not using this and you have no desire to use it whatsoever, what is the ability of a company like the lines company to force you to pay? Now, this is, um, I'm just using that as one example, but as sure as eggs, in my view, um, the energy sector in 10 years' time is going to look different than it does now. I think, what did Bill Gates said? He said, we underestimate... Uh, the change that is made in, that you can make in a year. So we overestimate the change that can be made in a year, but we underestimate the change that will be made in five years. And I think we're, this is what we're facing in this sector. And this is, and it comes back to my original point around risk. Uh, my, the question I ask, and I haven't got the answer, the question I ask is why would the government want to take on a whole lot of risk in this sector when we are so unsure what the market is going to look like in 10, 15 years' time? Um, let, let, me, let me talk you through a little bit of the, uh, the policy process in the Labour Party. And it's, you know, it's a lot easier when you've got the Minister here, because he can stand up and he can talk about the things the governments are doing and he can talk about their policy going forward because it's all out there and it's, a, it's either a good news story or a bad news story or whatever. In opposition, you can't. Op opposition is the most frustrating thing you can possibly do because I think the only two bills we've got through in seven years is gay marriage and Monday Mondayization. Is that how you say that word? Of, uh, of stat holidays. So you did get a holiday on Monday or an Anzac Day, so you can thank the Labour government for that. Uh, and if you're gay and you've got marriage, you can also thank the Labour government. But, um, <laughs> but my view on that is it didn't put one dollar in the back pocket of good hard-working Kiwis, it didn't pay off one dollar of government debt, it didn't create one job, and it didn't lift one, one kid out of poverty. And so what we can do at the moment is we come up with ideas. But let me walk you through the policy process. How it works in Labour is a policy is a policy until it's replaced by another policy. It's a long way of saying NZ Power is still our policy. Will it be our policy heading into the 2007 election? I don't know. What I can tell you is we're going through a very robust process and when Andrew stands up there and says every policy that we took into the 2014 campaign is up for review, that's not political speak for saying, oh, we can't be bothered telling you what we're going to take into the election. He actually means that. And we are looking at that at the moment. Um, and I know NZ Power was a big policy that, uh, that annoyed a whole lot of people. Um, but the worst thing that the sector could do, in my view, is say, you know what, it, it was an absolute rubbish policy, there is nothing to see here, move on, there are no, there are no issues. Uh, as John mentioned, what NZ Power was attempting to do was address issues that we saw in the marketplace. Now, whether it was right or wrong doesn't matter. What we saw was issues that needed to be addressed, and I suppose my plea to you today is if you want to be part of the conversation and if you have solutions that can address some of the issues that we have highlighted in NZ Power, we're trying to address in NZ Power, then please talk to me. And John knows this. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to talk to anyone around a table in a Chatham House rule situation and discuss a whole lot of ideas. I'm happy to engage. It doesn't matter what your political affiliations are. You know, as mentioned, we're for the good of the country. We want development. And we understand infrastructure is vital to first world development. There are... Um, the, the, there's one thing I would say, and I've banged on about this in Parliament a lot, and outside of Parliament. And if you've heard me, then I'm really sorry, because it means you've been watching Parliament TV, and I'm sure you've got better things to do than watch Parliament TV. Well, I hope you have. Um, uh, and I'm going to be political for one moment. I mean, obviously, you've, you've got me in here because I'm a Labour politician. Uh, I think the one thing, or no, one of the things that this government has done really poorly is manage our global brand. Now, our, our global brand, this, this um, clean, green, 100% pure brand, is what we go out to the global market with. Um, Ministry of Economic Development tried to quantify this in 2005 and reckoned it was worth about $20 billion a year. Deloitte did a survey and found that about 
80% of the companies that look to leverage, in, well, that look to, um, uh, to, to engage with overseas markets leveraged off our brand. And my point is if we don't protect this brand, in fact, if we don't start walking the walk as opposed to just talking the talk, then we become just another small economy peddling commodities into an ever-shrinking global market. And the energy sector has a whole lot of, um, uh, the energy sector uh, you know, has, um, has a whole lot it can do in this space. Now, obviously the transmission, electricity transmission, is a great story. What about 80% at the moment? Both National and Labor have bought into the, um, uh, the policy of 90% renewable by 2025. And in fact, I suppose if TY decides to close down, then we'll get there a lot quicker. Um, but we need, you know, we need to make sure that we protect this brand. And this is why when I talk in Parliament on this sort of stuff, when the opportunity arises, and you look at the energy trilemma, I look, into, I look at how we have fallen in terms of our environmental performance. And every single indicator, you know, Yale, uh, all, all, these, um, all these overseas bodies that assess a country's environmental performance, we have dropped significantly. And that's got to change. Because if it doesn't, then we run the risk of devaluing our brand significantly. And that's why, like I mentioned, that's why our drop in the injury trilemma is of such concern to me. And I will also say something else, that I'm not into subsidies in any way, shape or form. I'm not into corporate welfare. In fact, I wrote the foreword to um, the corporate welfare uh, report that came out, I think it was early this year or late last year. And these are, you know, these are further right than act. But corporate welfare, I believe, distorts markets. Um, and that's, you know, that's what we don't want in this. However, what I do believe, and this is, a, this is again one of the other differences between Labour and National. Tell me when I've got to stop, mate. This is one of the other differences between Labour and National. National believes you can step back and let the market control outcomes, and the market will provide the optimal outcome. And I think the Auckland house prices is an example where that doesn't work. Labour believes that where we see monopolistic power um, being exercised, or we see... Uh, commercial activity that, um, that is not in the best interests of, uh, of good hard working Kiwis, then we will step in. And again, that's what NZ Power attempted to do, but we can talk about that later, um, if it comes up in questions. But one thing a government can do, especially in a country the size of ours, is put policies in place or undertake programs that allows us to, di to direct outcomes in a way that we want them to be directed. Now let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, I think it's acknowledged that fuel poverty is a problem in this country. Um, you know, and you all know the definition of fuel poverty, you haven't got enough money to heat your house in the middle of winter. And this is the sort of stuff the media loves, and we've seen this recently where two people have died in cold, damp state houses, uh, and what that, you know, the media portray this as the government is letting down the poorest Kiwis. Look at this house, it's covered in mould and this sort of current. We don't know if that guy who died had rheumatic fever when he was five that went undiagnosed and he had a really bad heart and he had a really poor diet and he was going to die if he lived in a, you know, in the warmest house in, in Epsom. But all we hear in the media is this guy died in a poor damp state house and all we heard is that little girl died of pneumonia because she lived in a, in a cold damp state house. Now whether that's the full story or not, well, it, it won't be the full story, but that's how the media portray this. So let's take... Um, uh, let, let's look at energy poverty, and I'm just going to throw this out there. This isn't a policy, but it's something I've been sort of mulling over. Um, the 64,000, let's say the 60,000 state houses in this country at the moment, okay? And let's, and, and let's make an assumption here, which I think is probably correct, but let's make the assumption that if you're in a state house, you're one of the most disadvantaged or disabled, uh, sorry, disengaged, um, you're from the most disengaged sector of our, of our community. So when I hear uh, organisations say, or certain alliance companies say, well, you know, this is how we charge for power. Uh, we're going to let you know a week in advance when you're going to charge for your high peak, char um, high peak uh, usage, etc., etc., and we're going to charge you on that basis. These people aren't thinking, ah, now I must switch off my power between 6.30 and 7.30. These are people who turn on the water and have a shower when they're dirty and they cook when, when the dinner's ready and they, put, they plug the heater in when they're cold. These people are, are disengaged from the, you know, the, the nuances of the, sec of, the, um, of the sector that may allow them to make a difference. But let's say, with battery technology coming along in the next five years, that Harvard stuff is going to be commercial, and Elon Musk, $3,500, they're going to be $1,500. bucks. let us say the government says, you know what, we're going to retrofit every state house with one of these battery packs. Because I believe that when, you, uh, when a tenant goes into a state house, 
it, is, it enters into a contract with the government that the government will provide a warm, dry house, like you do with any sort of tenant or any sort of commercial relationship. So let's say, okay, we're going to retrofit 60,000 houses with, with battery technology that will allow them to, uh, to access energy at off-peak time so they can use it in on-peak times. Now, when I said these guys are disengaged, the technology will exist in five years' time, which will just switch these things on and off at, you know, when the peaks are coming and going. And already you've got an organiser, a power retailer who is accessing power, as we know, accessing power at wholesale rates anyway. Um, and so, okay, we're going to do that. And then also, let's, let's just make an assumption that of those 60,000 state houses, 20,000 of those are in positions which could leverage, well, which have um, uh, a better than average opportunity to, um, to put solar panels in place and charge their batteries with solar a lot of the time. So immediately what you do, and this is the government providing incentives, well not incentives, that's the wrong word, I said I was against that, providing <laughs> behaviours which create the sort of outcomes that we want. So we put this out to international tender and we say, okay, we want 20,000 <clears throat> 20, um, solar panels uh, over the next five years retrofitted to, um, you know, to 20,000 houses. But we also want to make sure that the deal you're offering the government is also offered maybe a 10% premium or whatever to the market as well. And then we go up with batteries and we say, okay, we want 60,000 batteries over 10 years put into these sorts of houses, but we also want the sort of deal that, uh, for the general public as well. So you're changing the whole nature of the industry. The government has the ability to influence outcomes because we're driving down the price of batteries and we're walking the walk. I mean, personally, I believe it's absolutely nuts that Crown Car 1 is a big German BMW. Now, it doesn't matter what you think of electric cars and whether they're the future or not, or, or the cost of the infrastructure to maintain a fleet of 15,000 electric cars. And I've, I've put this out here. It's just sort of a, you know, a thought burp. But let's see where it leads. But if we're not seeing, if the government isn't seen to be leading the way in terms of adopting this disruptive technology, and I, I hate that word disruptive technologies, innovative technologies, then how can we expect others to do the same? But like I said, what we are not going to do is go out there and say, um, okay, these things cost $3,000. Uh, we're going to subsidise 50% of that. And in fact, um, if you followed the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations that are going on at the moment, there's something called an Investor State Dispute Settlement Clause in there. And you'll, um, you'll, hear, <coughs> excuse me, you'll hear people say, this is the clause that allows corporates to sue governments. It's not as simple as that. And I've written a big legal opinion on this, actually. But I can tell you that two of the major um, cases in arbitration at the moment uh, instances where um, large corporates are suing governments because governments have either withdrawn subsidies on solar power or have put uh, an extra tax on power generation. And these big companies are saying this is outside of the, um, of the political risk that we envisaged uh, we would have to face and therefore we're going to take you to arbitration. So that's one of the reasons why I don't think we should be subsidising things. It's sort of, again, it's a risk mitigation strategy around that. Five minutes. Um, the other thing is let's... You know, so, so what I would say is the world is changing in energy generation and the way we use energy and the way we, uh, sorry, electricity, the way we use it. Um, I, I was, it was quite interesting. I spoke to one of the CEOs uh, because he, he called me and said, um, I didn't like your comment on Q&A when you said we pay too much for the power. He said, the situation is our power is actually really reasonably priced. It's just that we have cold houses and people use a lot more power than they do overseas. And I thought, shit, sure, that's a really interesting comment. And I hadn't thought of it from that. And so I went to the, the parliamentary library and, had, and got figures on that. And in fact, he's right. You know, we, we, we're about middle of the pack. You know, we pay more for our power than, um, uh, than the Greeks. <laughs> um, but also, you know, Finland, Poland, France, Turkey, Hungary, Estonia, Chile, Israel, Norway, the States, Canada, Korea, and Mexico. Uh, we pay uh, less for our power than they do in the UK, Sweden, um, just OECD general, Japan, Netherlands, Belgium, Austria, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Germany, Denmark, Spain and Australia. I suppose, you don't have to remember that, but I suppose what I'm saying is we're about middle of the pack. So our power isn't cheap, but our power isn't overtly expensive compared to a lot of other countries. Um, we can talk about the model. One other thing I would like to say, and this is one thing that gets David Parker really hot under the... Um, under the collar, perhaps don't print that Felicity or anyone else, is, uh, is what do we do about the price of water? Now we've got a real debate going on, on I'm, I'm the MP for Napier, we've got a real debate going on in Hawke's Bay at the moment around water. Two big things, is the dam, 
uh, Rua Tūnau for water storage, and I think Transpower actually had a look at um, investing in that, but pulled out in the end. Um, <coughs> sorry, Trust Power. Yeah, it wouldn't be Transpower, would it? Um, <laughs> Trust Power did. And we've also got um, a guy, because we've got some of the best water in, in the country. In fact, it is the best. It's being tested. That's just not me as a Napier MP saying that. We've got guys who want to pull bottled water and sell it into China, to a Chinese company. Uh, and the interesting thing is they've gone through the consent process, certainly for the bottled water, and they've got the consent, which is about, you know, the RMA is about managing natural resources. But the thing with water in that bottling plant is they can pull it out of that bore, bottle it, and sell it for free. There is no charge on that water whatsoever. And in fact, the Rua Tanifa for Water Storage Scheme, they are trying to price water. Uh, and that's part of the real debate going on amongst farmers and regional councillors and, and politicians, etc., etc., and economists. But the thing is, it's my view, if you do not, if there's no price on a, on a resource, then you don't tend to value it. If, um, if there's no value, then there's no incentive to actually seek ways to, uh, to optimise um, uh, its usage. Now, uh, I've written a document, a discussion document around this sort of stuff, and um, one of my points was the price of water. This is for hydro. And I know the arguments, you're not using it, you're just borrowing it. Um, you don't take any out, and everything that goes in comes straight out the other end. And what I said in this document is let's come up, let's agree on a philosophical point that water does have a value. And then I left it at that. And the reason I left it at that is if we start talking about pricing water, we get into a major, major debate around who owns it, uh, how's, how royalty is going to be paid, you know, what's it going to do to the price of electricity, etc., etc. And I don't even want to go near that debate. That is for, um, well, actually, John Key doesn't even want to go near that debate. So why would a backbench Labour MP want to go near it? Uh, but it is a real political hot football. But let's just, let's just acknowledge the fact that perhaps there should be a price on water. There's one other thing I'd like to say, and I've alluded to this um, uh, throughout the talk, actually, and that is our building standards. You know, we are way behind the eight ball compared to a whole lot of countries around the world. Again, I don't know if you saw the bit on Campbell Live again a couple of months ago where they were building a nine-star house in Christchurch. And they bought in the, in the uh, I think she was one, uh, an architect from the company that was designing it. She wasn't the principal, but I'm pretty sure, and I watched it a couple of times, I think that's what she was. Um, she said, how do we compare to Europe? And uh, so she was asked, how do we compare to Europe? And she said, we're 15 years behind. She said, it is dreadful what we do here. And we all know this. Uh, you know, we have friends stay from the Europe or States, and it's cold, and they say, shivers, it's a bit cold. And he said, well, put on a jersey. And that's the Kiwi to response to winter. You put on a jersey. Whereas in Europe, you know, you crank up the central heating or you're having a house that is efficiently um, uh, insulated. We don't do this here. And our housing stock is terrible. I think by law, you've got to have a, um, a three-star rating um, and to comply with the law. And as this architect on this piece said, people see that as a target, not as a minimum. Now, what this architect who was designed this house said to go from three star to nine star, and this is a residential property, so this isn't some sort of show home where it's going to cost an absolute fortune. I think it was an extra 10%. He said to go from a three star to a six star, it was 6%. Now, one of the things I would absolutely love to see, and I'm going to make this as a recommendation, I don't think, you know, keep in mind, as I said very early on, uh, my recommendations don't have to be adopted by our policy committee. Um, but I would recommend that we've got to make six star uh, the, the legal minimum. We can't keep building cold houses and just expect people to put on jerseys when they're cold. We've got to get our housing stock up. I mean, there's a, you know, there have been a number of books written on this, but the classic one is by an editor called, called Max Rashbrook, and it's called Inequality. If you haven't got it, I'd, I'd grab a copy of it, actually. It's, um, it's not left ring. It's sort of, uh, he, he hasn't written it. He sort of edited it. And it talks about the quality of our housing stock and how poor it is compared to a whole lot of countries. And as we know, as you, you know, all the, all the wonderful photos of, um, you know, of Wellington and Napier and this sort of carry on, uh, and the marketing brochures have these fantastic villas on the hill with the sun setting on the, and green and this sort of carry on. Well, they're 110 years old or 100 years old. They're as cold as charity. Um, and it is not a great example of the sort of houses we should be building in this country. Now, there's a political risk around that, of course. If I go out and say we want six star or nine star, or whatever, but the cost of, of building a house is going to go up by 2%, then that isn't going to go down terribly well in some quarters. But um, you know, that comes on to another issue around the cost of building in this country is, is 
you know, is extor oh, oh, no, I've got to be careful, is very high. And I'll leave it at that. Um, one, one last thing I'd say before I close down, and that is um, how it works in the Labour Party in terms of policy. This is, well, I was going to say theoretically, this is how it should work. Um, the spokesperson writes a document, which I've already written, full of a whole lot of ideas. Uh, then I, um, I give this to uh, internal stakeholders, i.e. front bench or other people who are keen to, to know about the ideas. They critique it. I rewrite it. And, um, and then I give it to, uh, well, this is what I would like to, to a group of external stakeholders uh, to have a look at and to critique and say whether they think this is good or bad or whether they have input into this. Then it comes back to me. I make the recommended um, suggestions if I think they're good or not. And then I pass it on to a policy committee. And a policy committee, which, which has some MPs, but it's certainly not all MPs, uh, a policy committee makes a decision about whether um, we want to take this into the 2017 election and whether they like the look of this or whether it will be amended. And then it goes on our manifesto. Now, um, that's unless you're the leader. Then you can stand up at a press conference and make a policy, and that's the way it is, and we support it. Um, oh, turn that off for that one. <laughs> I'm being slightly facetious. But there is quite a robust process. And when people say, when are you going to release policies? We get that the whole time from the media. Um, what tends to happen, and, and Labor, the Clark government was brilliant at this. The National Party would come out, the National Party in opposition would come out with a really good idea uh, for a policy. They'd release it and Labor would go, that's a fantastic idea, we're going to adopt this. And so they adopted a whole lot of Nationals' ideas as their own and they're the ones that get credit for it. So, you, you know, timing of policies has got to be quite, is, is quite crucial in the game. If you've got a policy which you know National will never adopt but you think is a really good idea, then you can release it earlier. Um, but keeping in mind, um, those of people like me in politics, and I, I don't consider myself in this, but, but if you're working in Wellington in politics, you can fall into the trap of believing that everyone is engaged in politics as we are. And you know, you go into the caucus room and people say, man, we had them on the ropes at question time that time. But you've got to remember, no one watches question time. Well, very few do. And so we've got a, you know, the vast majority of people are wondering around how they're going to have enough money to put petrol in the car, food on the table, pay their rent, their mortgage, get the kids to rugby and, uh, and you know, pay, oh, I was going to say, no, you know what I mean. Um, so we've got to be very careful uh, in terms of the political cycle. The press gallery are always going to call for us to put out policy. In terms of our energy policy, uh, I don't know when we'll release that, um, but it will be released in good time and I will talk to John and when we're going to release it I will ask him if I can come here and, uh, and talk to all of you. So um, in question, you know, when we get a Q&A please don't ask me uh, what our policy is on this and that. Please don't ask me if I'm going to roll back NZ Power because my response to you will be what it has been. Our policy is our policy until it is replaced. Uh, and I've gotten in big trouble before when I've viewed my own personal opinions uh, out of time in an untimely manner. But, um, so yeah, that's the way it is. But I want to reiterate, and I, and I really mean this, uh, I would like your ideas and your input on how we deal with the, with the issues that we face today. And you know, you know the issues that, um, that Labor has highlighted. You've had a, you have a feel for the issues that are operating at the moment. And if, um, uh, and if you don't, again, I'm happy to sit down and talk, talk you through the way we see things. But, Again, I want to reiterate, we're, we're not going to close you down. We're pro, we're pro development. We want this country to go ahead. We know that a strong economy is vital. We know that energy security, energy equity, and, uh, and environmental impacts are vital. Um, so we want to work with you, with the sector, to, uh, to get the best possible outcomes. Thanks very much. Right, you. You, you talked a bit about the... Is this on? Yeah, yeah. I assume it is. You talked a bit about the um, uh, the Lions Company side of things, and it, we didn't talk too much about retail and generation. Is sort of what, what's your thinking around what the issues might be specifically in, in that part of the sector? Uh, well, in the retail sector, uh, obviously price always comes up at this time of year because people believe they're paying too much. Um, David Shearer got a really good story up. I mean, we worked on this, but we, where you had um, uh, Mighty Rivers Glowbug. Which was below the price of your, you know, your stock standard and contacts. What's the contact offering called? You know, your prepay, which was above. Um, he knocked that on the head. So it's always going to be around pricing and energy equity. There's no doubt about that. Generation. Um, let's wait and see what happens with TY. Actually, uh, again, it, it's. I go back to my my comment around risk. 
Um, under NZ Power, you know, you know that the government put out to tender any project that it saw needed to be uh, undertook in terms of meeting generation capacity. Um, but again, let's just wait and see what happens there. Uh, and I think you've already answered it, but, but time frame for your decision making, you know, when, when should we think about, you know, we're talking about a year hence before we sort of... Uh, I, th I think in, in terms of this, you're probably going to be a year out. Look, if, you, if I had my way, it would release a lot earlier. Um, but there is, a, you know, there is a process, but then there's the political considerations around how is this going to play out there. There was a feeling in the last election, Labor released far too many policies and far too close to the election, so everything got lost in the noise. In fact, it's quite interesting. Louisa Wall's comment around uh, passports for transi transgenders got more airplay than Labor's policy on um, paying the dole to organisations who are employing apprentices. So Labor now has got to be a lot more astute in how it um, releases its policies and its messages. But this, this will be a big one, so it'll, it'll be out there. A last one that you may not want to or be able to answer, but um, sort of a dislike of direct intervention in the market would seem to be at odds with the NZ Power idea. Mm. Can you offer any kind of comments around that? Yes, it is. <laughs> the, the, other thing I do, uh, is, well, the other thing also is, um, you know, the transmission pricing um, methodology has come out as well. And, and you know, my, my first point I made, this is the transfer one, my first point I made is there are, econo there are economic arguments for something and then there are political optics for things. And it won't surprise you that even if we understand economic arguments, uh, we've got to play the political optics around things. And uh, I must admit, my first reading of that was really, you know, but let's see what happens with regard to, um, to that. Uh, thanks for that uh, presentation, Stuart. Um, the you made a good point about uh, technology evolving so fast, this one year versus five year time horizon, a lot happens, things like that. And then you talked a bit about the stranded assets problem of, of the electricity lines companies mm. in particular. Huge problem um, mm. to be grappled with and so forth. Do you think that um, political intervention and policy making is a very blunt and cumbersome tool for dealing with this type of rapid change and should politicians kind of but back yeah. away a bit? Yeah. Uh, look, um, political intervention often is a really blunt instrument. I mean, uh, policy making is, I mean, industry and, um, and stakeholders and voters expect political parties to come up with policies. Now those policies can be highly interventionist or they can stand back and say, hey, we're going to let the market uh, undertake whatever action is necessary to remediate whatever issue arises. And so policies themselves don't have to be seen uh, in a negative light in any way, shape or form. I mean, I will say my one concern is when you've got all these 29 lines companies and they're owned by different structures and a lot of them by community trusts. Um, it's, you know, my one concern is that uh, a government at some point is going to be asked to come in and bail out a lines company. Now, again, I'm doing a lot of work in terms of the bank debt of these various organisations. Of course, a lot of them are community owned. And so you get a cheque in, in your back pocket in the middle of winter, which goes down very well with a whole lot of, um, of, of voters, I'll be honest. <laughs> so, you know, what the government does with regard to that uh, is a really big question. And how we manage that sector is a really big question. The other thing I'd ask is, you know, do we need 27 lines companies? Well, that's what we've got at the moment. But is that a sustainable model going forward for the next 10 years when we are looking at at the risk of potentially stranded assets. And I, and I don't know where that tipping point is for a lot of um, these companies. I mean, Wholesome Cement is closing down the West Coast. What's that gonna do to Western Lines? Um, you know, how many, how many consumers have to go off grid before um, things start getting really expensive and, and run into trouble? You know, Red Stag Lumber in Rotorua is the largest sawmill in Australasia. It generates all its own power. In fact, feeds some back into the grid. So you know these sorts of models are going to become more and more prevalent um, as you know technology advances, and uh, you know one thing we do know is that doing well business as usual uh, means that you're probably going backward. I, I know that's real cliche, but in this industry, I think it is um, it is really really relevant. So yeah. Sorry, <coughs> Stuart uh, Ralph Martis from the Major Electricity Users Group. Thank you very much for that. Um, I can see the path forward in terms of Labor developing its policies for the next election. 
but I was quite taken by your initial comments that for the next election, possibly you're going to have to have a coalition with the Greens. And I actually think it's actually the combination of your policies and the Greens policies, which is the most important issue. For example, the Greens absolutely hate thermal power stations. Mm. Completely irrational in my point of view. Mm. Um, but your, your policy might actually be quite rational and you mm. can see the benefits of having thermal in the mix. Mm. How do you resolve that? How, how do voters know where a potential coalition government might get to on that question? You know, the really interesting thing, which really took me aback at the last election, is when the media asked Russell Norman, what are your bottom lines for going into government with Labour? And he said, we have no bottom lines. And I thought, how can you not have any bottom lines? What do you stand for? You don't stand for anything if you don't have any bottom lines. So I suppose what I would say is, um, listen to our, you know, understand what our policies are. Again, it's a, it's a, I talked about risk before. It's, you guys have got to weigh up the risk of, of the Greens influencing <coughs> Labour in certain policies. Uh, my view in this one is uh, our policy will be the dominant one. The Greens may feed into some of it, but you know, geothermal stations, no. You know, uh, but again, you know, what would we do? Would we say to contact so you've got to close down your $650 million investment? I don't think so. What, they, what they're right into is, um, is renewables, but so are we. Um, it's how we achieve that. But really, um, again, I don't know what the Greens are going to take in the next campaign. They haven't released any of their policies. I assume it's, and I, I, I haven't talked to the Greens about this, I'm assuming their stance is the same as ours. Their policies are their policies until they're replaced by another one. But, um, but I wouldn't be too scared of, uh, of their, their, macro economic poli uh, their macro energy policy because I suspect what we would do is we would sit down and say, OK, you know what, you want all these houses insulated, let's go on to do it. You want um, the solar sort of program I was talking about before, um, then let's sit down and see how we make this work. But in terms of the, the really macros, it, it, it has always been under MMP that the major political power, uh, they tend to have the dominant policy um, in the really big areas. So don't be too scared of the Greens. I mean, it, it mightn't work out that way, but you know, the way the numbers are falling. Uh, the, the Greens are like a... Um, oh, is it still going? The Greens are like... You know, I door knock the whole of Napier. And I often got, oh, you know, I like you, I don't mind your party, um, but oh, it really worries me about the Greens. And that's something that Labour's got to deal with. Because uh, you know, Labour is actually seen by a lot of business people as sort of moderate. They know we're not going to rock the boat, but they do see this Greens as really scary. And Labour does have to um, find a way to deal with that situation if we want to be in government. Uh, it, it sort of moves on to your chorus slash technology uh, angle. Apple might be able to lose a billion dollars on a failed technology, but taxpayers probably don't like white elephants like that. And when you force markets to adopt technology early, such as the UFB, which would have been built but probably 10 years hence. Mm. You know, look at the issues that that has created throughout the regulators, the country, <laughs> customers. I mean, how is the government any better placed to take bets on technology than, than industry, not just electricity? I mean, mm -hmm. So um, are you talking about solar and battery technologies? Well, yeah, and, and just technology? when you say we want to encourage, but then you say we're not subsidising and incentives is the wrong word. Mm. You know, I mean, I'm not sure how you, you know, doesn't encouraging mean building the network yourself, for example, or something like that, so. No, what it does mean is using its buying power to go out and, um, like I said, retrofit state houses. You know, no, th there is no organisation that would come even close in this country to say, OK, what we're going to do is put out for tender um, the, the, the level of... Um, purchase to retrofit 60,000 state houses. Now, you did right. I mean, I, when I uh, lived in Auckland, I um, used to drive past this uh, appliance store and there was this big plasma TV in there for $10,000. And we all looked at that and went, man, wouldn't that be fantastic? You can buy a TV which is slightly bigger than that for $700 at the, at, in you know, the warehouse at the moment. And I suppose the real question, and this is the question that governments have to ask as well as consumers when it comes to technology, is what point do you jump in? because things are changing at a great rate or not. So should I have bought that TV at $5,000 or $2,000 or $700? Or do I wait until those curved screen Samsungs drop in price and then jump in there? At some point, you've got to make a decision and say, we're going to do this, but, but also leave open the door to say, um, we're not going to, uh, again, if I use the, the stranded assets thing, we're not going to be in a position, though, where we can't upgrade or update as and when is necessary. 
So I suppose um, it comes back to what one of my points is we've got to live the brand. At some point we've got to, we've got to dip our toe in the water and say we are not walking the walk at the moment. We are getting caned overseas because our brand doesn't stand for anything. And if we want to be seen as this clean, green, 100% pure paradise that we take to the world, then we've got to start living that. I mean, I'm digressing slightly, but you know, we're going to go to Paris and we're going to get absolutely caned because the Clark government used to lead climate change and now we're seen as laggards. And this started in 1984 when David Longy stood up and said no to nuclear ships. And I believe it was a completely unintended consequence when people put their heads up, you know, the global community said, shivers. What, what are these guys doing? These guys actually stand for something. And ever since then, people have known what we stand for. But now, I'm not too sure if we actually stand for what we say we stand for. And if, you know, I've, I've said um, half, half jokingly, but half serious, if I was Fonterra's major global competitor, I would send a team of private investigators over here to, uh, to do a whole lot of work blowing that clean green myth out of the water, and then I would run a global PR campaign around how New Zealand's image is a pure myth. And I reckon it wouldn't take long, it wouldn't cost much money to destroy our global brand. So if we don't start living that, and this, excuse me, and I don't mean, uh, I'm not talking about um, a green perspective here, I'm talking about this from a business perspective. And I say, you know, it doesn't matter if you, if you support climate change because you've got a beachfront property and if the sea levels rise by a metre, you, you know, you're in trouble or because you want to save polar bears or you want to save the world. The reason why I think it's really important that we, um, that we champion climate change, even though there is a cost associated to that, because it plays into our brand proposition that we make a hell of a lot of money on in the global marketplace. And if we don't stand for something as a really small economy, then the ability to leverage anything off our brand diminishes significantly. I know that's sort of a really roundabout way of answering your question, but I hope I've sort of addressed it. I really admire the way you talk so candidly about the political optics of the sector because, um, you know, this is a reality. And uh, I think the point you make about transmission pricing is one that people are acutely aware of. But, you know, it's probably a result of the statutory objective that the regulator mm -hmm. has, which is set in very economic terms. D does that mean that a Labour government might repurpose the regulator with a more trilemmary sort of set yeah. of objectives? Yeah. <laughs> I've got to be really careful how I answer that one. Um, look, I, you're dead right. And uh, when I was talking to, the, to Simon Bridges at a select committee, so it's all on record about this, and said, come on, Simon. And I was trying to get him to admit that if you take $40 million out of TY's power price and you add that price to the consumers of, well, of, of Auckland and Northland where all the infrastructure has been built, I was trying to get him to admit that just doesn't look that good. It might be the right thing to do from an economics, but it doesn't look that good. And he wouldn't admit it. He knew, he knew the game we were playing. Um, but he did say there's a whole lot of, you know, there's more water to go under this bridge than goes through a couple of hydro stations. Um, I, you know, I, I do quite like the energy trilemma index and the way they do things and the rationale they use. Uh, would we change it? Well, you know, we have, I'm, I'm not saying yes to that, but what we... Talk, what we're talking more and more about is not just having GDP as a key measure of our wellness, uh, well-being in the country. We've got to look at other variables, especially in the 21st century, when others are again looking at not just GDP, because GDP can say one thing and it means nothing if you're getting people dying in state houses, or that gap between um, the CEOs who are earning a substantial amount of money and those who aren't earning much or, or can't live on a on a minimum wage. So. If you, if you translate that up towards the energy sector, it's a, for me it's a really attractive model and a really, uh, and a really attractive way of looking at the sector. But whether we're going to ad officially adopt that, you know, I can't say at this point in time, but it's a, um, you know, if I was the leader of the opposition and this was a press conference and I could make policy on the hoof, you never know what I might say. <laughs> All right, OK, we'll wrap up the questions there. We've got uh, Rob Whitney, uh, Beck Chair, to give a vote of thanks. Stuart, I'd like to thank you for that. I think you've given us a really good understanding of the way um, your energy policy and Labour's energy policy is going to uh, develop over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, I'm pleased to see that um, the, the WEC trilemma is at the core of it, and, and particularly how you're using the trilemma, how you're mm -hmm. unbundling that metrics and, mm -hmm. uh, and using it for, for, uh, as a strong way uh, to guide for guidance. Like the way you talked about risks and opportunities, and, and, and particularly as a, a, a as a technologist, I like the way 
the role you see for new technologies. Uh, mm. I've often said um, uh, solar panels are only uh, plasma TVs working in reverse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and, and what I, th I think we're, we're, we're seeing is that maybe there will be several technologies lining up uh, and we will get the rapid change. So it, it's, you know, I think you've seen, mm -hmm. I identified this is a real opportunity for the industry, but it's a risk for others in the industry. So Absolutely. I'd like to ask everybody to thank you, please. Thank you very much. Thank you.